I have seven o'clock by my watch, so we're going to call our meeting to order. It's March 12. Um, as I said, it's uh, 7 p.m. The board met starting at 6.15 p.m. in executive session to discuss some collective bargaining matters. And we are now beginning our open session. As we always do uh, at these meetings, please, and uh, everyone in the room, if you wouldn't mind, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for that. Um, so our first item tonight is uh, discussion and decision making uh, on the part of the board relative to uh, the one remaining retail marijuana license that exists here in Tewksbury. Um, I just want to set the table for everyone. Uh, I'm sure there are a number of people in the room interested in that topic. Um, before I get to that, I want to note that um, select board members Kratman and Holland are joining us remotely this evening. They decided to leave three of us in the lion's den alone. So, um, so those of you in the room will understand that they're uh, fully active participants, but uh, they're virtual. Um, so this is the, what I would characterize as the board's deliberation phase. Um, some of you have been following uh, our hearings on the uh, marijuana licenses. We'll recall that we closed each of the two public hearings that were held but, um, to consider the applications that were presented to us. So this evening there's no uh, public input. The only folks who will be offering any comments on this subject matter this evening are the five board members. And ultimately, hopefully, we'll have some decisions to come to a consensus on um, as we move through that discussion. Um, many of you know that this process started, I think the uh, town meeting adopted um, the, or allowed by vote, um, the sale of retail marijuana in Tewksbury going back to October of 2022, if I recall correctly. So this has been on um, everyone's agenda um, for some time. I also will note um, that we had a previous round of uh, interviews and decision making that involved eight applications. Um, and as many are aware, um, the board at that time decided to award only two, and um, we can award up to three licenses. Um, I have said consistently, and I believe my colleagues also um, have uh, stated the same, um, there's not a requirement to give them all out. That's the maximum number. Um, so uh, we've given two, and we'll see what we do this evening. Um, but there's no guarantee that a third gets, gets provided. Um, tonight, we have to decide on the applications for Sundays and also for 133 cannabis. And we'll take them in the order that they uh, presented their applications to us. So we'll discuss the application for Sundays uh, right out of the gate uh, first and foremost. And then we'll talk about the um, 133 cannabis application when we conclude our discussion on Sundays. Okay, so I will... Um, open this up for comments and uh, any discussion that my colleagues wish to offer. What I'd like to do, as I said, is focus on Sunday's application. And as a courtesy to the gentlemen who are virtual, um, I'll start with you, Mr. Kratman. Thank you. Uh, I've uh, read through the uh, application. And, uh, gone through each and every one of the 
changes that have been made. Um, and honestly, I think there has been some changes, but not, not much to um, answer a number of the questions I have with uh, the traffic concerns in that area and, um, and uh, honestly, the parking and a number of other issues that we've gone through. But I'll, uh, I'll listen to the rest of the board and listen to their things before making any recommendations. But thank you. Mr. Holland, do you have comments or? Yeah, I have a couple of comments, Mr. Chairman. Um, and one is, I reiterate what Mr. Kratman said, is the parking. And the parking is piecemealed with buying a condo and, and having employees park there and their 15 parking spots. And what happens if you get busy or oh, we'll use the We'll make negotiations with the park, the, the people that own the condominium association. And the other thing is the experience, the marijuana experience with the applicants. I have an issue with, with that section of it. Uh, and, and I'm kind of torn that I, I don't think I can support it. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hall and Mr. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so focusing just on the Sunday's application, um, this is one that we've had since October, I believe. Um, I know that they went through the planning board, got their site plan approval, where traffic and parking were addressed uh, to my satisfaction. Uh, I know there was additional requests for information that have been addressed in the meeting. Um, the other areas that I was looking at based on uh, our application process were financial, uh, the location, uh, and the ownership slash experience. Um, I do believe that the experience element is addressed through the inclusion of a uh, consultant, and that is something we have seen on other applications, and that seems to make sense to me. Um, so I'm, I'm generally in favor of the application, seeing as they meet all of the major criteria and have a technically complete and viable application. Okay. Ms. Wellman, do you have comments to offer? I do, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I thought that Sundays brought forward a more complete um, and a better application in the second round um, than in their first round. Uh, for me, my decision making on these locations and on the applications have been around financial issues, um, the uh, ability to maximize revenue generation, uh, to minimize traffic impacts in, uh, on our local streets, and to minimize impacts on residential neighborhoods. Um, I do not believe that this location is going to be one that will maximize revenue generation um, because of its proximity to highways. And I think it will increase traffic impacts uh, just because on the local roads, they'll be coming, in, we've, uh, coming into local streets. The other locations that we have previously approved um, are located near highways or certainly on Main Street. Um, Near the near the highway, so for uh, Lazy River, so I think that those ones have minimal impacts and um, will generate more revenue for the community. Part of the reason we passed this as a community was to revenue to generate revenue, because we can only increase our levy limit two and a half percent. So this is new growth that we look at, and that is a consideration that I am um, looking at with any of these applications. So um, as Mr. Kratman said. I'm open to what our committee, what other board members have said. Um, I'm curious to hear what the chair says on this application as well. Okay. All right, so let me um, first say that um, personally, um, I'm not a fan of retail marijuana in general, um, but our town, as I stated earlier, voted to support it. And at town meeting in October of 2022, um, adopted an article to allow for this process to unfold. So my job is to um, protect the community as a whole and determine under the um, article that was adopted um, which qualified candidates 
um, should be granted licenses, if anybody. And um, I can tell you that um, in the first round of decisions that we made, um, we started with a blank slate and as the uh, presentations and the decisions unfolded and we look at the results of the two that were granted licenses, um, I think my philosophy around um, what I favored um, was built on two things. Ms. Wellman just referenced in her comments one of those two things, and that is um, the location in our community. I liked the fact and I supported um, the two that we voted for um, because they're on the outskirts of town. They're right off the interstate for, in the best location that I felt was appropriate. But more importantly, both of those applicants were um, owner operators with experience. And that makes a big difference in my opinion. They have a track record, they have ample capitalization, um, and they have um, current uh, business operations that are um, in the industry. So we know what they're about. And the chances of success, in my opinion, are greater because of that. So those two factors weighed heavily in my decision making then, and they continue to weigh heavily in my decision making now. The article that um, we, excuse me, the article that we adopted requires that this board determine whether an applicant is, quote, suitable and a responsible licensed candidate, unquote. And I interpret suitable in part to have that level of experience that I just referenced. So with regard to Sundays, um, I'll note that we previously heard from them um, relative to the same location. And in my view, at the first presentation, the first round of presentations, my evaluation led me to conclude that Sundays was the weakest of the eight presentations. And they didn't get my support largely due to two main concerns. I had significant concerns about traffic um, at that end of town. And I think that the intersection of Main Street and Shawsheen Street is a significant choke point in our community. It's gonna to continue to be so. I also think that the intersections of South Street and Salem Road are problematic, even with the re renovation of the intersection, when we add the potential for additional traffic up there. I travel that road daily um, to and from work, and I know firsthand um, the time delays and the waits and the backups on Route 38, particularly coming back into Tewksbury um, from Wilmington on a daily basis. So I'm relying not on traffic reports or studies, I'm relying on firsthand real life experience to come to my conclusion that um, I have concerns about the traffic at that end of town. Secondly, and more importantly, in my opinion, um, Sundays at its first presentation um, didn't offer really any operational experience. The, the ownership is, has no history running a retail marijuana operation. Um, and as I said after the second presentation more recently, I credit them um, for an improved presentation. I think my colleague to my right just made a similar comment. Um, their presentation was much stronger, in my opinion, to their credit. Um, and the fact that they added a consultant to their, to their team to assist them with planning, operational, and compliance needs, again, I think gets closer to the bullseye. Um, however, after listening to the presentation, and reviewing the hearing on tape a second time, 
I'm still left with concerns about who the day-to-day -day manager would be and who would regularly be on site. In fact, if I think back to the first um, hearing, Mr. Tosto um, then um, led me to believe that he was going to potentially consider giving up his current profession to be on site. Um, and even despite that um, presentation or representation, um, the lack of retail marijuana experience was still significant in my mind. But I became more concerned more recently at the second hearing when we were told that he would initially be on site only two to three hours per day. And that left me wondering who would literally be in charge of the operation. We don't know. Um, and this kind of comes back to the essence of what my concerns are around experience. Um, in the previous two licenses that I voted to support, they involved owner operators with extensive experience. We know who is going to run the operation and that they have significant experience running those operations. That was of paramount um, value, in my opinion. Um, so based on the lack of experience and based on my concerns around the traffic, um, while the local ownership component is worthy of consideration, um, I don't think it trumps the concerns that, um, that I have relative to the experience and my responsibility to safeguard the community. So I'm not inclined to support the application, and I, I want to state that. I think that the applicant made every effort to improve the situation, um, but um, in my opinion, um, no operational experience um, still is of significant concern to me. So I'll stop there, um, and I will um, ask if my colleagues have any other comments they wish to offer. Mr. Chairman, at this time I'd like to make a motion to deny the application for Sundays that I submitted. Okay, do we have a second on that motion? Second. All right, so I am required to take roll call votes this evening because we have two people attending virtually. Um, so for the record, uh, our recording secretary's benefit, uh, Mr. Kratman offers the motion to deny the application. Mr. Holland seconds it. So Mr. Kratman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Holland? Aye. Mr. Mackey? No. Ms. Wellman? Aye. And the chair votes aye as well. So that would be a four to one vote um, in favor of denying the application this evening. Any other comments on this application? All right. So now we'll turn to um, the second application. <clears throat> and that's um, 133 Cannabis. And I want to first state that um, late this afternoon, um, the board received correspondence from um, Mr. Dean Graffio, the president of Route 133 Cannabis LLC. And he wrote, uh, dear select board members, I write to you respectfully requesting to withdraw my application for cannabis licensure without prejudice. I feel that I have been forced into this position by a baseless lawsuit and this is the only way I can preserve my interest in the license while also allowing me the time to have this suit dismissed. Only after dismissal would I feel comfortable coming back before you to be judged on my own merits and not the unsubstantiated allegations of a failed candidate for a previous license. This lawsuit was clearly strategically timed and I do not think it is fair that it factor into the analysis of my application. I still have not been served with the suit and given my chance to respond, even though it has been in the press and shared around town. 
it is clear to me the intent was to try to smear my name and interfere in this process. It comes with great regret that I ask to withdraw without prejudice, have this frivolous suit dismissed, and come back before you in the near future. I, I truly appreciate the time and effort you have all spent on review of this project and look forward to working with you again. I also respectfully would request this, that this letter be read into the record to explain my withdrawal and provide the necessary context to my supporters across town. Thank you, and again, as I indicated, this is signed by Dean Graffio, president of 133 Cannabis LLC. Um, so that's now in the record. And let me ask if my colleagues uh, wish to offer any comments or any motions uh, based on that particular correspondence. I'll make, I'll, I'll make a motion to with, uh, accept the uh, withdrawal without prejudice. I will second that motion. All right, before I call for a vote, are there any comments? from any of the board members? I hear none. No, I have oh, comments. Ms. Wellman. I've, I, my comment is regarding um, resident concerns that I wanted to respond to a brief portion of it that was raised during the course of this application. It is not directly relevant to the withdrawal. Okay. So that's All right. to prep. OK. Yep. You want to offer those now? Yep, really, right. <laughs> really briefly. Um, one of the items that came up uh, first of all, thank you to all the residents who are here tonight and have sent us correspondence on every location. We've received correspondence from residents on every location, and I appreciate the effort and time that residents have uh, taken to share their thoughts with the board. Uh, one of the items that came up um, through this process was the proximity of this, of this applicant's um, location to a daycare facility in town. And... Um, the only legal uh, opinion we received on that was from applicants' counsel, which is understandably a self-serving legal, legal opinion. And so I uh, personally called the CCC and I emailed the CCC, the Cannabis Control Commission, to receive guidance from the state. And they were remarkably tepid in their response and, you know, virtually useless. And um, I sent uh, some information, I did get some information back that they thought that it might be, it might qualify under the school provision. So I asked town council to, uh, through the manager, to seek further guidance, actual information. Um, and he was unable to do so because they don't return phone calls and they don't answer their phone. So this comment isn't directed at the applicant, it is directed at the CCC. And I think for a state agency that should be offering guidance to communities that are going through these processes that are based looking at you know, time um, and schedules should be responsive and they're just really missed the mark. And so I wanted to let the community know that the board heard your requests and your concerns, that the board followed up on those concerns and staff also attempted to follow up on those concerns as well. And and um, it was important for me to let you know that we're listening to you and we're being responsive to you. And so those are my comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we have a motion um, and a second. Again, for the record, the motion was offered by Mr. Holland, seconded by Mr. Kratman, um, to accept the withdrawal without prejudice. Um, Mr. Kratman, how do you vote? Uh, Mr. Holland? Oh, Aye. Thank you. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. And the chair will vote in the affirmative as well. So that's five to zero in favor of accepting that withdrawal. So that will bring that matter to a close, at least for now. Any other discussion items on this topic? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, we've been spending quite a bit of time um, reviewing these applications and it seems like we're getting uh, multiple applications for same locations, and um, we've got a lot of other things that are going on in the town. Seeing that neither none of these um, locations have opened yet, we really don't know what to expect um, until the two that we have issued get open, and we have an idea of what 
what what what we've what we've already issued. Uh, and with that point, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to make a motion that the select board establish a one-year moratorium, which we will not accept uh, applications, accept, consider, or process any applications for retail marijuana uh, licenses for one year. Okay. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mackey. Um, vehemently oppose. To Ms. Wellman's point, we did this as a way to generate revenue and based off the past few months of discussion around budget and potential shortfalls and the, the threat of a deficit in coming years, uh, I, I do not believe it would be prudent for us to take away a tool that we pursued and voted into our toolbox that was supported by the residents and approved through town meeting. So I, I believe that would be a uh, not a good move for us to make. Any, excuse me, any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, I agree with Mr. Kratman. I think we should put a moratorium on it for at least a year, six months to a year, or at least until uh, the other people open. The, the other, okay. Okay, Ms. Wellman? Yeah, um, I have a question for my colleagues through the chair. Um, is it the intention to wait and see what happens when they open and then wait and see how they do? And if there's like a problem to adjust from that point of view, or is that, um, is it something else? No, this is, to, to, yeah, that's good to, to the chair, I'll respond. Uh, <laughs> my, this is something new that we've, very new to us all. We have a couple of locations. We have no idea what the revenue will actually, because there are, multiple locations and other communities around us. This may be something that's very, very busy or something that's not deriving the revenue that we thought we'd be getting. And I'd, I'd like to s spend some time focusing on, I mean, we've issued two licenses. We have three. We don't have to issue all three, as we mentioned. And I'd like to see how those progress and then have that license and have a better knowledge of what we're doing when we issue that next license. So it would be, uh, I, if, if they all work great, great, we issue the third license. If it turns out that we have problems that we did not foresee, now we have the knowledge in front of us of what we're looking at. Okay, um, so I, I disagree with this motion. Um, I think the board does know what it's doing. I think we have a, a process that we can follow. I share perhaps my colleagues um, frustration with this process. Um, I think there has been specious commentary in town. I think there is bias in town. Um, I think, and so I'm, I'm kind of um, agitated by how we have seen things progress with some applications in this community. But that being said, I think that um, this board is capable of handling that. We have demonstrated that we're capable of handling that. And um, I'm, I, I am not interested in holding a spot either and saying we'll give some time for the applicant who just withdrew to maybe bring it back later when this matter he has to deal with is you know potentially resolved. Um, we're not. There's no, you know, um, appropriate measure to do that. And I don't know that a moratorium might be um, a way, a mechanism for that. Um, so. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to sit on this for a year and then potentially miss an opportunity that might be before us as well. Not that I know of any in town. So, thank you. Okay. You have another comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to further the uh, the sentiment of my opposition to this, we everyone on this board hears about the concerns about empty storefronts in town. And I don't know why we would want to take away a mechanism to fill empty storefronts. Um, we've got plenty of open, open storefronts, open space to you know, do development. So I don't know why we're not trying to further push this. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So um, you're gonna have to refresh my aging memory. We had a motion. Did we have a second on the motion? We did. I'll second. We did. we did. Okay. All right. So it's Mr. McCrabman with the motion, Mr. Holland with the second. Um, all right. So, uh, Mr. Crabman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Holland? Aye. 
Mr. Mackey? No. Ms. Wellman? No. So you're going to leave it up to me. Yes. Yeah. And the next time we talk about this, I'll be in the cheap seats with the rest of the crowd. <laughs> so um, I'm going to vote um, against the motion. Um, and the reasoning I'm going to offer is that um, I believe um, it rests with the board to make the decision. There'll be other people at this table, at least one other person at this table. Um, I think that their judgment needs to factor into the equation. Um, and the process has been spelled out in our bylaws and the article that allows for applications to come forward. Um, I personally believe that um, a pause would not be a bad idea. That letting the two um, licenses that we've previously authorized get off the ground and allow us as a community to see what that experience brings to Tewksbury would be prudent. But I also have to weigh in my thinking, or I have in my thinking, that um, any business operator in Tewksbury has the right to bring an application forward. Um, and this board should discharge its duties in accordance with what that request brings. So that's the reasoning for my vote. Um, and I will wish the board well in the future as they um, address this moving forward. Okay, we're gonna move to the next item on our agenda. And that is, um, we have invited representatives from the Shawsheen Valley Technical School Committee to visit with us this evening. If you're present, please join us up here. So first of all, welcome and thank you for being here and thank you for your patience while we tended to that, um, that item. Um, can I ask you for the record to just uh, introduce yourself so we can capture that in the minutes? If you don't mind, and please make sure you use those microphones. Yep. Okay. My name is Tony McIntosh. I'm the superintendent director at Shawshin Valley Technical School. Thank you. I'm attorney Patricia Muse. I am the Tewksbury representative of the school committee. I am Cheryl Bartoloni. I'm also a Tewksbury representative on the school committee. Thank you, all three of you, and welcome to Tewksbury. Thank you. All right. Um, so thank you. Um, I, th I think, <clears throat> in short, um, we, we received um, your request um, requesting support um, for the establishment of a stabilization fund. Um, and I know when that was first brought forward to this board's attention by the town manager, a number of my colleagues had questions about the um, mechanics of it, if you will. Um, and I think we had probably in general some concerns about um, the potential financial implications for the community. And I'm sure it's no surprise to you, but um, you know, we, uh, we see, um, you know, the increases in assessments and we recognize, of course, that some of that is associated with student population and things of that nature, but um, costs also go up. So um, we're not blind to that. And I know the Finance Committee has expressed concerns in the past. I know this board has as well. Um, so we're trying to just kind of better educate ourselves as to why mm -hmm. this is being raised now, what your intentions or thoughts behind it are, and then maybe um, if uh, the three of you can elaborate a little bit on um, you know, the, the uh, mechanics so that we're assured that if we choose to support it, there's some level of control or safeguards in place so that it's not opening a checkbook that we didn't inadvertently in, intend to do. So I know that's a lot of questions that I just threw out there, but um, we're hopeful to have just a general dialogue about it. And did did all of you receive the um, the advisory document yeah. that I shared through the town meeting? Yes, okay, we did. perfect. Yeah. So, thank um, you. so again, just uh, to to try to answer as many of those questions as I can. Um, 
our building's 54 years old. Uh, we are finding uh, last year we had about a $475,000 capital request for building repair. Um, we are seeing more and more of our capital budget being allocated to, you know, extraordinary maintenance, repair of the facility, and keeping those things up. Um, we came forward to ask for this um, essentially to give us some flexibility. Um, we are considered uh, our own municipality under uh, Chapter 71. Um, so by establishing this fund, um, if we have a good year, if, if we've saved on snow removal, if we didn't spend as much on heating, whatever it is, um, come the end of the year, we have to have our, budget, our, our surplus certified, the, the excess and deficiency report. Um, and again, if we have money available, um, we still have to come back to the towns. So there's really two ways for us to fund this. We can do it up front if, if we know what's in our excess and deficiency account. As part of our budget process, we can come out, we can tell the towns, we're gonna take X number of dollars from our excess and deficiency fund and put it in our stabilization fund and have it approved as part of the budget process. The other way to do it is to do it as a budget amendment. But either way, it has to go back through our sending communities um, and, and they have to approve it and sign off on it. So we, we can't do this in isolation. Right. Um, what we're looking at doing, um, and, and again, we've, and I've been honest with, with the other communities we've been in, we've submitted three statements of interest. Um, we're gonna submit another one. Mm -hmm. um, what we're running into is, is while we have a well-maintained, um, cosmetically appealing facility, mechanical systems, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, um, in, you know, infrastructure for internet and, and, and the other things that are there um, are on borrowed time. And, and we know that at some point in time, you know, there's there's going to be some either either major renovation or an expansion or possibly, you know, depending upon on where we go, um, a new building. So as part of this request, we want to be able to take when we have those years where we have some money left over um, and start to put it in that stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if, if things go really well for us and, and we get into the MSBA process, um, you know, potentially in a year or two, we're going to be looking for money uh, for a feasibility study. Um, from what I've heard, you know, that's like one and a half to two million dollars at this point in time. So either we have to come back to our communities and ask for that funding, or, you know, we're hoping to have this mechanism to, to save some money on our own. Yeah. Um, if we don't get into MSBA, the reality is those things aren't going to go away. Um, you know, some of the examples I've used in the other communities that we've been to, uh, the switch gear for that building is original from 1970. So the company that built that has been out of business for about 40 years. If we ever have an issue with our incoming power, uh, it's going to be a big issue. Um, you know, other things like we, we have some collapsing drains, uh, floor drains, um, which in itself isn't really a big deal to fix. All of the hallway tile in that building was put down with asbestos glue. So in order to remove the tile, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars to abate the, the floor tile to do a three or $4,000 drain repair. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are kind of coming to fruition. Um, and, and again, we were looking at what options do we have. Um, we, again, we try to maintain money in that E&D account as much as we can mm -hmm. you know, for those, those bumps in the road, those hiccups. Um, and, and we're kind of at our cap on that. Mm -hmm. So this is just another mechanism to allow us to save some funds. What's been the reception in the other communities in the district? Um, it's been good. I, 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 we've been to, I, I, I should say we, um, I've been to Bill Recca, I've been to Bedford. Um, I, we've had some communication with Wilmington and, and I think we were able to answer their questions. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're here tonight, so. Um, okay. it, it, seem, it seems like it's positive. Again, a lot of places had questions, you know, about the funding mechanism and, and what our intent was to do, right. you know, what, what our intent was for this, this funding. Yeah. So, um, again, I think it's just getting out and answering questions and Absolutely. being visible. So. Yeah. So it's my understanding, and I read this about a week ago, and I, so I may not have this 100% right, so correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, but um, we would potentially support it. Um, you you might ask for some funding. Um, we'd potentially authorize it, but once that's authorized as a community, not this board, but the town meeting, um, then the control kind of diverts exclusively to your you and your committee. Is yeah, that that's correct. A yep. fair statement. Yep. And so. which you have two school committee members correct. who on mm -hmm. that budget, like you, mm -hmm. you have a job. We have a job. Yep. Understood for that. Understood. Yep. 
Okay, so I just want to understand the functionality of it. Um, and now there, there's a cap on it, right? Is that correct? There's a cap on how much money you can move within a given year, yeah. um, and I think it's I 5%. think it's it's five percent you can yeah. move, and then there is an overall cap, but I don't remember the percentage off the okay. top of my head. Do you know um, how many other regional districts have a stabilization fund? Um, so it, I know I know Whittier has one. Um, I know Northeast has one. I believe Minuteman has one. Okay. Um, so there, it, it's it's not uncommon for the regional vocational schools yeah. to establish. Yeah, them. That's what I was looking. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, <clears throat> how this came to be is we were at a meeting with other schools, mm -hmm. and they all said, oh, why don't you try a stabilization fund right. because of the last year with that $400,000, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. And so obviously, mm -hmm. a lot of school districts do it, regional yeah. schools. Yeah. And, and I will add that, um, you know, in our experience here, mm -hmm. right, we, we have... Um, been believers in the concept, right? So we, we support that conceptually. It's made a big difference in our community. Um, and it wasn't that long ago when um, that wasn't the case. So, um, so I think you're in somewhat friendly territory, but we have to fight over the few pennies that are available, right? It's budget season, yeah. And we're heading into, um, it sounds like, some headwinds from a financial perspective, right, From a, on the economy or state aid, and that has a potential impact here. So, all right, so um, I've dominated uh, the question. So let me ask uh, Mr. Crapman, do you have any questions? You're on mute. Yep, I'm off now. There Thank you. you. Um, so I, I, I do know that Shawshank Tech has made a number of improvements, building fields and other things, lighting and other improvements around the area. And you were able to do it without the stabilization fund. Um, like, what is, is there a major project that you have on the horizon that you're looking to have this thing, the, the funds put aside for? Or is there, I understand the, the uh, you know schools aging and most schools are but uh, like is there a, is there some significant spending project that you have coming up in the near future that you're looking to put this money aside for? I mean, just um, mechanic repair mechanical systems is a big one. Um, we had that wall repair last year, but I think we have one hundred and seventy-five, one hundred eighty thousand uh, dollars for the replacement, the re uh, replacement of one of our main uh, ventilation units this year. Um, there's twelve or thirteen more of them that are the exact same design and configuration that we're going to have to replace. Um, in answer, uh, kind of the the driving force behind um, the conversation at the school committee level was we have, um, and, and I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I think I used the acronym. We've submitted a statement of interest with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Um, I believe this this year will be our fourth application. So we are anticipating, you know, again, at some point in time, we're going to have to do a feasibility study. Um, and again, if we have money in the stabilization fund, we can also use that to either offset the feasibility study or to offset the, the amount of money that we have to go back to our communities and ask for them to fund. So again, we're, we're trying to be proactive here. We're trying to get out in front of this, knowing that it may be a year or two or three years before that actually happens, um, but just giving ourselves the opportunity to start to put some of that money aside. Thank you, that's uh, insightful, thank you. Mr. Holland, do you have any questions, sir? Yes, I have one question, Mr. Chairman. That is, uh, you're, you're taking the money for the stabilization fund, you had a money set of turn back in, is that correct? So we are allowed to keep um, what's called an excess and deficiency fund because we, we are our own municipality. Um, we, we don't have the ability to, you know, to come back to the town, the town meeting of the select board and ask for money. So we're allowed to carry 5% in what's called an excess and deficiency fund, up to 5%, I should mm -hmm. say. Um, what ends up happening is every year through the Department of Revenue, we have to get that certified. They look at any, th any accounts we overspent, anything that we had an excess in, and they give us this report. Um, which I believe is also sent to all our communities as well. Um, what we're proposing to, the, the way we're proposing to fund the stabilization fund is to, is to start to transfer money out of that excess and deficiency fund and into the stabilization fund. The, the big advantage of that is the stabilization fund, um, we can actually um, get a rate of return. We, we can get interest and revenue off what we invest in that. We can't do that with our excess and deficiency fund. So, I mean, that's also one of the advantages that we're looking at with this with this approach. OK, 
Okay, let me ask you this question. Now, if there is a deficiency on the town side, do you get to apply the 5% to the town? No. I'm not sure I understand the, the question, sir. Well, say there was no money turned back in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you assess each of the cities and towns the 5% towards their budget? No. Once once okay. our assessments are finalized, they're finalized. It, we, that would have to go back through the whole budget approval process. It would have to go to town meeting. Um, we, we can't just uh, assess additional monies. Um, that's that's why, I mean, we, we're, we're pretty tight about when we issue assessments because we wait for the state numbers to come out to make sure that we're we're on target. We know that we can fund our budget for the year. Um, so we're we're very conscientious of that. Okay, so you can only assess if you have money that is turned back in. Is that correct? Transfer money to the stabilization fund if it's right. if it's excess. Yes, that that would be our point. So, and, and again, if that were to happen and, and it was to be certified, we would still have to go back to the towns and say this is what we're doing with this money. The towns would have the opportunity to say yay or nay, um, and then if it would get transferred into the stabilization fund. Okay, thank you for your answers. Uh, I'm all set, Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, Mr. Mackey. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, let me just say, I think this is a great financial tool. We leverage them in town. I'm glad to hear that you guys are trying to forward plan. So all about that. Um, to follow up on Mr. Holland's question, um, how does this impact your assessments? Mm -hmm. So the creation of this account, how does that impact assessments? So I, I mean, I can tell you my philosophy and the current philosophy of the mm -hmm. board is that it won't impact that at all. Um, that does not, I mean, I can't, I can't say what's gonna happen five years or 10 years from now. Um, the board could at some point in time decide to add this to an assessment. Based on the current financial situation we're in, that's really not a smart move on our part to try to do that. Um, but essentially what, what we're looking at and how we're coming at this is again, just to use that, that excess money that we have. Um, and it is not our intent at any point in time to add any kind of rider or anything to our sending communities. Um, and again, if, if, we can, if we can be uh, proactive and we can be fiscally responsible and, you know, and garner, garner some savings, that's the way we're gonna try to fund this. It's one of my favorite words. Um, so let's just say hypothetically it, it was included in the assessment. What, what impact would that have? Uh, so again, it, it can't be any more than 5%. Um, but again, as as our budget, and, and I, I believe we were here last week with the uh, with the finance committee, mm -hmm. um, and again, the, the sending communities all have to vote every year on that. So if it comes out as part of the assessment, and it's and it's driven up um, the assessment for the communities, I don't anticipate them supporting that. And then we're back to the drawing board as to how we're going to fund this. So um, there is there is some um, there is a mechanism there for for the, the sending communities to say no, you know, we're not in support of this. Um, we're not going to move forward with this request. Awesome, thank you. And uh, my final question is: How many times in the past ten years have you had a surplus? Have you been able to add to that uh, we, surplus and deficiency? We actually fund? returned some last year, believe it or not. Because again, now that we're at that five percent, sometimes it's a, it's a little little tricky to know exactly what's going to come in as as an excess or deficiency. Um, so we returned um, we returned about three hundred and forty two thousand dollars to our sending communities last year. Okay. Um, do you know over the like other previous years, so like past 10 years, ballpark, I don't need a hard number, has it been like more often similar, than not? It was a little similar or a little higher. A little higher. Much, yeah. I, I want to say it's only been maybe two, two or three times in the last 10 years, Mr. Yeah. Montori. Is Definitely that sound two right? in the last, say, four years. Okay. So yeah. that, that I can remember, I don't remember it happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Wellman, do you have questions? Yeah, just a couple. Um, I'm just going to dig in a little bit in that neighborhood. Um, so you returned about 357000 last year? Uh, $342,277. There you go. Um, how much do you typically have in excess of deficiency total? Like, do you plan on moving most of that? So or I, just what's above the 5% that you carry? Well, again, we, we were going we're gonna to try to be proactive and move that out as part yep. of the budget process ahead of time. Yep. We can carry 5% of our budget. So, I mean, yeah. that's around a million and a half, somewhere in that range. Um, 
we actually haven't got to the point of discussing what we're going to move out. Okay. Um, I mean, in my mind, it's it, I'm thinking it's you know a few hundred thousand dollars um, each year, and then you know if we can continue this and, and we, we continue to be able to be be able to fund this the way we anticipate, um, you know, we'll be able to transfer that money over a period of time. So what is, what do you normally what do you normally certify for excess and deficiency annually? Total five percent of the, the budget. So what was your our, total excess and deficiency last year? What was the number? I don't have that number in front. Okay. I'd, have, I'd have to go back and look. I did not bring that with me. Okay. Um, I, I can I could send that to, to Mr. Montori in the morning if you sure. you'd like. Um, I think that's I think it's a great idea to have a stabilization fund to take these excess funds. I'd rather you kept them then and 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 save it for these things so that mm -hmm. it helps mitigate those big expenses. Mm -hmm. I have no issue with that. I am concerned about. Not you. I understand your intention. <laughs> I love intention, um, but when it's not you someday, and then if there if there's well, you know, we're going to put in this five percent increase, and we're going to front load. I don't love that um, because there is then there is sort of now it's the assessment, and I understand that there's a mechanism, but it's a majority vote of the towns. So yeah. as long as the majority of the towns vote for it, it doesn't matter what a couple of the towns say. And so I don't, so I don't love that. Well, our, our majority is four out of five. <laughs> right. So all it takes is two of them to say no to our budget, and we're, we're not going to get it passed. Has anybody ever said no to your budget? Uh, this is only my second year, so. Um, I don't think anybody's no, ever said no, no to Josh E. Tech's budget. Come no, on. Come on, Patty knows. <laughs> so far, you're on no. 100%. No, no, I don't think anybody's, I don't think there's, it, it, it just, I know how this goes. So, um, and so that's my only real hesitation is I would love to see language that's that's memorialized in, in the creation of a fund that says it is funded through excess and deficiency um, you know, certified as that's where it, that's the mechanism. That would I would 100% support that. I would shout it from the rooftops. I think it's great. Um, I'm I'm a little concerned if there can be this. I mean, I read through the language, and that was the that was what I I, was, I asked Mr. Montori. Is this am I reading this the way I think I'm reading it? And it seems that that the language is there for that. So I don't know if the law allows that or not to to kind of refine that language or if anybody else will support it, I'm just the only one. But um, that's kind of what I'm thinking at the moment. I, I mean, I know the motion that we brought forward is is right out of, um, is right out of the law, is, is, is kind of the legal precedent. So I, I don't know if that's something that we okay. can modify or not. Okay. Um, yeah, we can't do like a side letter MOU or something like that. No, I, I love to do things like that. Um, okay, I appreciate that. I appreciate your candor. I really appreciate you guys coming tonight and taking the time. I know everybody's got busy lives and um, and your busy night. And it's it's wonderful to see you um, and, and have this dialogue. And I, I think we'll probably get to talk to you again some more soon based on your statement of interest that's coming forward. So, you know, I think there's, I know that um, we have many students in our community that rely on the excellent uh, education that they receive at Shawshank Tech. And I know that our representatives are um, guardians of that work, and uh, you are fierce in that. But I, I do and appreciate They're great that. to work with, so. That's great. Yeah, and I, I just I appreciate so much that you came tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me just close with two questions. Um, one is, um, and it kind of dovetails on what Ms. Wellman is driving to, and, and I guess that goes to the topic of communication. So mm -hmm. um, I know, um, and this is uh, experience from a long time ago, but um, my recollection is that um, there's uh, typically in the budget season, there's uh, you know, pretty strong and regular communication with the town managers in the district, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just, uh, I guess, assure me that that continues and under your tenure, that's a priority item, right? It goes to the good communication that we can, as a community, understand. Right? We've, I believe we've had two in-person meetings yeah. um, just around budget. And yeah. again, um, I know Mr. Montori and, and myself will email and, you know, he'll, he'll right. send me requests and I, you mm -hmm. know, I try to respond to them. Yeah. Um, you know, I, we were we were a little behind in the budget cycle mm -hmm. last year with with the new Sorry. governor coming in, and I know there was yeah. there was a little angst and anxiety around that. But um, you know, we put out we put out a timeline early in November. Uh, we've stuck to it. We've met all of those deadlines. Um, like I said, we were here. I think it was.
was last week, present the finance committee. Okay. Um, so, you know, um, I know I was uh, myself and the business manager and, and Ms. Muse were at uh, town meeting last year um, just to be available to answer questions and then respond to any concerns. So um, that's that's my strategy. My approach is is to be visible and, and be part of the yeah. part of these proceedings. Good. Yeah. Communication. Right. And, and um, I, foresight. Um, right. Oh, well, I'll just say and that's a priority of the school committee members that, you know, their town managers are always aware of what's going on because that's the way it's always been done since I've been there and I've been there almost 30 years. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I had a little problem last year. I wasn't real kind to him last year. And I said, what happened? Well, good. We appreciate right. that. <laughs> so right, it's important um, that we have a line of sight, right? And, mm -hmm. and, that, and if there's concerns, they should be there, an opportunity to register them, right? And have that dialogue. So I appreciate your response to that and um, welcome continued discussions. Um, so my second question is probably more from Mr. Montori and that's um, if the board wants to take action on this, I assume it has to get into the warrant and need to be acted on a town meeting with a recommendation, mm -hmm. is that so, fair? So what's the timing of the warrant at this point? So the warrant closed um, around February 18th, 16th, but I already put a article on the warrant you did okay subject to assuming we might and you know, unless the board tells me different we'll stay in the warrant it's under the uh, Shawshin Valley Tech School Committee uh, as the uh, sponsor uh, which under our bylaws they're allowed to put one on um, and then we'll deal with we'll address it when the board reviews the warrant articles the finance committee will have a public hearing and then ultimately town meeting okay and the, has the finance committee taken any position on this article yet no, they haven't reviewed the warrant articles yet at the hearing. All right. And the language is precisely out of the statute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you don't need any action from us tonight other than maybe to endorse it conceptually. And you can endorse being on the warrant if you want, and mm -hmm. um, you can take up whether you approve or support the article at the, uh, at the time the, the board yeah. takes up the warrant. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. So, um, Mr. Kraven and Mr. Holland, uh, I assume you heard what the town manager just said. If um, I'll, I'll ask if there's any motions, and I want to make sure that I hear from you both. Okay, nothing. Okay. Anyone at this table? No. Okay. Um, so it's on the warrant, and I know we will review the warrant. Um, so um, we'll take a position at that time. Um, so thank you. It's been thank helpful. You. We yeah. appreciate it. It's good to see you all. Really good clarity. Right. Thank you for that. Right. Okay. Um, I want to thank representatives of NIMCOG if they're still here. <laughs> um, for their patience. Um, we're running a little bit behind, but I want to welcome you and welcome, come on up here to the front. You're getting an education in municipal matters this evening. Yes. So, <laughs> um, so welcome. Thank you. Yeah, and welcome back, I should say. Yes. So, um, so our recording secretary is not here, so if I can just ask you both to give us your names um, for the record, that would be much appreciated. Sure. All right. Sure. So my name is Kelly Leinema. I'm deputy director at the Northern Middlesex Council of Governments. Thanks. And I'm Jennifer Wright. I'm the executive director yeah. at NIMCUG. Thank you. And welcome again. Um, all right, so you want to talk to us about uh, something. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what. So Yeah, the, uh, thank you for having us this evening and um, really appreciate this opportunity. This is really just us giving you some updates about NIMCOG, answering any questions that you might have, and sharing with you um, some details about recent projects that we've completed and then ones that we're going to be working on with the town. Okay. I think that was primarily all, but we are open to entertaining any other things that you wish to sure. discuss with us regarding our work with the town awesome. or the region. Awesome. 
Okay. So just to familiarize everybody, um, the Northern Middlesex Council of Governments, we are a regional planning agency. Tewksbury, of course, is one of the members of, of the NIMCOG region. Um, and we are one of actually 13 regional planning agencies across the state. Um, we were formed in 1963, so we've been around for a pretty long time. And we are governed by an 18-member policy board, which includes uh, Ms. Wellman, who is our select board rep, um, James Duffy, who's the planning board rep, and then Alex Louder, who is the alternative representative. And uh, we meet monthly at NIMCOG's office as well as hybrid, so there's an opportunity to participate. Usually it is the third Wednesday evening of every month um, at 7 p.m. So anybody, of course, is welcome to attend, including those folks who might be listening or interested in learning more. Um, the agency is really a planning consultancy, but we also do a lot with regard to regional coordination and collaboration with the goal of enhancing municipal and, of course, regional capacity to do all the work that you already do and more. Um, some of the things that we work on include uh, issues related to housing, economic development, transportation, uh, conservation and climate resiliency, GIS and mapping, um, and then also we provide other regional collaboration and coordination services including weights and measures. So for example, we are the sealer for the town of Tewksbury as well as many other communities in this region and actually beyond. Um, Pretty large, the, the largest share of our resources actually goes towards regional and local transportation planning, which includes helping to get our communities to have projects that they're working on locally that they can't necessarily afford to finance with local uh, municipal funds or through bonds um, that are uh, transportation or infrastructure types of improvements. Those are things that get funded and or potentially approved through the Northern Middlesex Metropolitan Planning Organization, or the MPO, um, which is basically a, an, an adjacent body that operates also monthly and makes determinations with regard to how we spend uh, federal transportation dollars. So those are the bigger dollars that folks go after at the local level and at the state level for things like big bridge replacement, major corridor plans, sidewalk replacement, that kind of thing. So we've helped the town with things like this um, related to the town center, Route 38 improvements. Um, we also helped with some intersection improvements and analyses at Route uh, 133 and River Road. And then we also provide traffic counting services, which helps to document and understand or perhaps underscore the need for transportation improvements. Um, so those are the types of services that we provide. We also coordinate with the Regional Transit um, Authority, the LOL, the LRTA, which of course Mark is um, um, a member of. And uh, in our capacity though, we help with planning services to make sure that there's good um, bus transit and other types of coordinated uh, human services transportation, like for people who may be older or people with disabilities through the Road Runner program. Mm -hmm. And part of the work that we do is really in support of the LRTA staff. Um, we uh, most recently worked with the town on a housing production plan, as you probably know, because you adopted it. <laughs> um, and and that is now an approved plan, and of course, we're working with the town as part of advancing that plan, including helping with the MBTA community's law uh, requirements uh, through Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 3A. Um, and that, of course, is a, a whole separate endeavor, but dovetails with your housing production planning work. And then uh, the, the last thing I'll note is that we also help the town to in, uh, maintain its green communities program status. That was a program that's been in effect for more than a decade, and Tewksbury has been gaining uh, a lot from that program with regard to helping with energy efficiency improvements across municipal buildings, and then looking for other opportunities to um, electrify or decarbonize or find ways basically to save money um, and uh, comply also with the Green Communities Program. We've been an aggressive community in yeah. that area. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So mm -hmm. it's been wonderful to be able to support mm -hmm. uh, the town in that manner. Um, we also work with the with uh, Mr. Monturi and other, um, <laughs> his peers, 
across the region in coordinating other opportunities. And so most recently, we uh, provided an application to the state through the Community Compact Program to try to secure funding and resources to create a regional housing services office. And so we're, we're hopeful that that endeavor will move forward as well, which would be another example of regional coordination and collaboration. And Kelly's going to talk about some of the upcoming things that are going to happen or things that we're working on as well. Perfect. Sure. Thanks. So as Jenny mentioned, the vast majority of our work is funded through state and federal funding. So we've received um, funding from the Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Authority, and then we also, that's funneled through um, via MassDOT funding through our, through our agency. And then we also we receive district local technical assistance from the Department of House, or the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. And then we also do our own pursuit of grants um, to fund additional projects. From the community end, most of our work is requested by our communities, and then we contract with our communities to perform that service using the funding that we receive from the state and federal government um, and from those other grant sources. So this coming year, we're doing a number of projects direct to the town of, uh, with the town of Tingsbury. Um, or sorry, yeah. Tewksbury. We've been in a regional Almost. housing strategy meeting all day, so I'm conflating all of our towns. Tewksbury. Yeah, we'll. we'll uh, <laughs> I kind of like that, though. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> um, so this year we'll be working on a small lot zoning analysis. This is a direct recommendation of your housing production plan. So we're working with your planning staff in order to advance elements of that plan. We'll also be looking at a number of your recent plan, um, planning initiatives, your housing production plan, your open space and recreation plan, your master plan, and reviewing those plans and understanding prioritization and maybe matching them with additional grant funding that you could pursue in order to implement various elements of those plans. Um, on a regional level, we are doing work around economic development. So we manage the Greater Lowell Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, and we will be doing a new one of those in the next year um, that will be considered the five-year SEDS. So that sets out a plan for economic development, support, and growth of the region in a five-year period of time. We also, as I mentioned, we just did a regional housing strategy kickoff. So we are doing a regional housing strategy called At Home in Greater Lowell. That process is kicked off, and that is to look at the nine communities in the NEMCOG region and think regionally about how we, what is appropriate at different community levels in order to support housing growth, support residents, um, address um, the needs of our unhoused population, the needs of popula population of our citizens who make a low income or make a moderate income or who are trying to, to locate in this region. So this is an overall strategy that we'll be looking at wrapping up by the end of the year. As Jenny mentioned, we do a lot of work with regional MBTA communities, um, so we are helping our helping Tewksbury and the other communities in our region advance zoning amendments to that effect. Um, and then regional work around regional housing work group, energy efficiency opportunities, um, supporting the housing choice, in, choice initiative, and then um, weights and measures, so additional funding for weights and measures outside of the amounts that we have contracted with each of our communities. Finally, outside of that, we are pursuing our Greater Lowell Vision Zero Plan. So this is a plan to support a vision of zero fatalities or serious injuries through our transportation network. Um, this is um, not just for pedestrians and cyclists, but also involves vehicles. We want to reduce the, the number of, of those injuries, and, and we, our goal is to get to uh, zero. Um, so this is an overall strategy looking at high injury networks across the region and how we can reduce those injuries and fatalities. We're also working on a regional digital equity plan to support um, internet infrastructure and access and services for all residents. And then I also mentioned the comprehensive economic development strategy. So and finally, we are doing a um, climate per CPRG. Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. It's basically Thank a climate you. action plan for the entire region, which will help to, like a lot of these efforts that we engage in, they're planning initiatives that then allow us to catapult from there to apply for funds to implement things, or design things, or build things, or solve things. But usually they start with a planning process. Yeah. 
So that is the work that we'll be doing over the course of the next year. Um, and Jenny mentioned the work that we've done in the past. Um, we're happy to take any questions that you might have. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add. No, just a, a, a big thank you. It's wonderful to work with the town staff. Um, very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to get to do that and definitely um, to have Jane representing your board on the council. Um, wonderful contributions and we look forward to continuing to work together. Yeah, well, thank you for all you do, for sure. Um, and I know we've had a long uh, history of partnering with um, the agency, so that's been very positive and helpful. Um, Mr. Crabman, do you have any questions or comments? No, I do not have any at this time. Thank you. Okay. How about you, Mr. Holland? I have no questions. Mr. Mackey? I have no questions. Thank you for coming up. That leaves it down to Ms. Wellman. <laughs> I mean, I always have questions, but I don't have <laughs> any real questions. Um, I do want to say that um, working with you guys is um, always a pleasure and a challenge sometimes. You have to read and keep up with you. Um, the level of knowledge in that office is, is um, significant. And Jenny, you coming on board and some of the recent um, hires that you've done, like Kelly, really have um, elevated the agency tremendously and then just talking about all the different things you're doing, you have kind of a lot on your plate. The amount of value that the community, that Tewksbury and um, your member communities receive is un unbelievable um, in, the, in the how you can help us um, plan for all the different things we want to do and capture those funds. So, you know, it's, it's important for the public to understand that you really, you, and NIMCOG's really delivering a lot of value for their individual communities, I would argue more so than some other planning agencies. They're just really big, and just really big, and you know, it's hard to get in, but um, you guys really um, are just setting a new tone in our region, and uh, it's fantastic to see. So um, you hit all the stuff I was gonna ask you about, so I have, I have no further comment, except I'd like to get part of Route 38 on the tip, and we can talk about that later. Oh, but, you know, the south part of town that, you know, um, our DPW director is sitting behind you, and oh. we, Kevin and I have talked. Excellent. So, yeah, but um, I have ideas. But we definitely need to finish up Route, route 38, and uh, that's the big one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you very right. much. And I'll, um, I'll rest on those uh, comments as well, because I think they're very, very valuable. So, so let me thank you, uh, ladies, for uh, joining us tonight and for uh, your patience while we work through some other items. But um, you're always welcome here. And if there's anything you want to share with us along the way, please reach out um, to the town manager's office, and we can have a shorter discussion, or you can send us some materials, and I'm sure um, the board would be uh, very open to um, those updates. So, Excellent. thank you. And you're very welcome. Thank you for the time tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Have a great night. You too. Okay, um, we've now managed to get to um, the residence portion of the agenda, and I just want to ask if there are any general comments from any residents in the room? No? Okay. Um, so we'll turn to new business, and the first item under new business is a uh, tree herring objection. So I think our tree warden is here. And um, I'm going to ask you to give us some background. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, you. Uh, members of the board, Kevin Hardiman, Public Works Director, uh, as well as Tree Warden. Yeah. Uh, I'm here because uh, recently we had a request for a tree removal. Uh, we determined it was a public shade tree uh, under Chapter 87. Uh, therefore, we had a hearing on that matter. Uh, and at the hearing, there were two objections to the removal of the tree. Under Chapter 87, the matter then comes to the select board to make a decision on the, uh, the disposition of the, the Can matter. Can you give us some more detail on, uh, I know it's uh, Compass Lane, if I remember right, but yes, uh, the tree lies. a little bit about the tree and the reasons for the objections, if you will. Uh, so the tree lies right between 59 and 49 Compass Lane. Uh, it's a 29-inch pine tree, about 100 feet tall. Uh, the DPW has done work to the tree to, to prune it, to uh, you know make it safe. It is a healthy tree. Um, I don't want to speak to the the objections. I'd like to, okay. to let the residents do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, as they were the ones that objected, okay. as well as the resident who requested the removal is here as well. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so um, if that's the case, um, 
who wants to speak on this item? Because we need to be educated. So, uh, sort of just come up to that microphone right there if you don't mind, okay? And give us your name and your address. Yes, sir. My name is Michael W. Norakowitz. I live at 59 Compass Lane okay. in Tewksbury. And are you the gentleman who requested? I am petitioning to the town to remove the tree to at my expense. Remove the tree? Okay. That is correct, sir. So why don't you tell the board a little bit about your reasoning behind that? Over the years, this tree, I'm, I never said that it was uh, an imminent hazard or if it's uh, diseased. My belief is it is aging out. It is a pine tree and it's notorious to snap branches, the branches of every brittle. High winds, heavy snowstorms, uh, limbs come down, not just branches, limbs come down and take out my service. Either whether it's cable, and I could be out, out of phone, internet, and cable for up to three days, up to a week. Mm. This last snowstorm on January 7th of this year, two branches came down, well, limbs, I apologize, limbs. They came down one in the morning, they missed everything, one in the evening, it took out my power for 47 hours. Luckily, I have a generator, but it also increased my gas bill, almost doubled it. Mm -hmm. uh, again, phone, it, and then the cable are out. My wife works remote, so we're now out of money. It causes damage to my house. Um, the tree lists everything. I, the little research I've done, again, the branches are very brittle. The limbs are very brittle and they fall, and the tree tends to have a wind sail effect. The tree tends to topple from my, my research. I'm not an arborist. My opinion that the town of Turksbury understands that this is not an ideal tree for their town's right of way. And that's based on the uh, planting list that is provided. And I, I have some for the, uh, for the board. Um, and that. That's on, let me see. I understand the, the uh, objection of the neighbors of 49 Compass Lane. Um, I understand they prefer, pro, they, like to, they like shade. Um, they, they objected for three reasons at the public meeting. One is it's one of two trees in the front of their house and that they provide shade. Um, and my response was, she is correct, it's one of two trees which are town owned in the front yard that could provide shade, an oak tree and a pine tree in dispute. The pine, tree, pine tree's foliage, for lack of a better term, starts somewhere at the 75 foot mark of the tree, the tree being approximately 100 feet tall. Uh, the oak tree with the foliage starts lower and is fuller. I have, I have uh, photos of the tree. That she has also has a dog and she spends three to four hours a day out in the front yard. Yes, she owns a dog, and we spend time out there as well. She also argued that to, there's trees in her backyard, so there'd be shade in her backyard, but she can't go back there due to coyotes. And this is my response. We have trees in our backyard and spend time there as well. And yes, there are coyotes that travel through and live in the woods, along with fisher cats, fogs, deer, turkeys, rabbits, squirrels, to name a few. I've even seen a chicken, and there was a bear at one time. We border and own forested property. Wild animals typically live in the forest and it's not uncommon for them to roam. We have removed over 20 trees from our property and haven't seen an increase in wildlife population in our yard. The pine tree in dispute does not and will not prevent wild animals to roam into Ms. Gaia's front yard. It's not a fence. Basically in summary, we are not unsympathetic to Ms. Gaia's desire for shade in the front of a house. But this tree is not her tree. We are not seeking permission to remove her personal property. It's a town-owned tree. A tree that the tree warden could state is an eminent hazard in a day, a week, a month, or a year, and remove it without hearings. Mr. Hardiman has advised me, and I have agreed to the terms, if I'm granted permission to remove the tree in question. But by not allowing me to remove the town-owned tree, the limbs will continue to fall. Public utilities to my house will continue to be a target for the falling limbs. My house will continue to be damaged, which I will need to be repair at my personal expense. Loss of income for my, for my wife since she works at home. Possible injury or death to people passing by from falling limbs. And in the end, at some point, the tree will be taken down, either by Mother Nature or by the town of Tewksbury when they determine it's, it's an imminent hazard. Ms. Guy's desire for shade, which I argue that this pine tree does not provide her, should not come at a cost to me and my family. I ask the board to uh, her permission to remove the tree. I will provide you 
I also like to thank Mr. Sedwick uh, for jump starting the conversation with uh, Mr. Hardman here. Sir, before you step away from the microphone, just one question. How long have you lived at that? 13 years, sir. 13. Approximately 13 years. Thank you. Okay, that's helpful. Yes, sir. I ha and I, I have, that was basically what I originally was a synopsis. I can give you my written presentation if you'd like. That's fine. I, think I also have video and uh, yeah. pictures if you want to see damage. I think we're okay. And my okay. colleagues on the TV won't be able to see that uh, anyway. I so. for that yeah, no, don't apologize. Uh, um, we can take that. Yes, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so um, I want to invite you. I assume you're the neighbor, right? Yes. So please come up to the microphone so that folks at home can hear you. And if you want to give, um, give the board a little bit of your perspective, just pull that down a little bit so we can see you too. Thank you. So give me your name and your address, okay? Okay, uh, Kathleen Gaia. I live at 49 Compass Lane. Thank you. I've been in Tewksbury for almost 70 years, and I've lived here uh, at this address for over 45 years. Okay. Good. And I have two trees in my front yard, and that's all, you know, there was trees on the side, but as he said, he's taken down everything between our two houses and around in the back. And I got in the trees behind our house, I just don't feel comfortable because um, every night I can hear the coyotes out on the other side of my house and in the back, and they're big. You know, we've, we've seen them. People up and down the street, we keep calling around that, okay, the coyotes are here and there. And it's, it's, you know, when we take the dogs out at night, me and the neighbors on the other side, they have to go out with big flashlights and sticks and everything just to, <laughs> Because if you've been out there and you hear them, those coyotes are wild. And they're huge. They're not little coyotes. Yeah. Okay. And that's, you know, and I'm out with the dog during the day. It's, I've only had the dog. We rescued it about a year ago. And it's old. It can't defend itself. So I don't want to take it out in the back. And the coyotes aren't out me out at night. We've seen them during the day over for 45 years. I've probably seen them a half a dozen times dur during the day. Okay. Have you had any issues with this tree? Any limbs falling in your property and your your? Yeah. They all fall on my property. Yeah, they all do. Okay. Because it's on. It's if you all look out my bay window, the tree is my maybe 10, 15 feet from my house. Okay. To his house, it's probably 70. 80 feet over to his house. Oh, yeah. So the tree is like right in front of my house. Okay. And they have fall down. And when we do, we pick them up and we drag them out, you know, cut them up and take them away. Yeah. Most of them, you know, we take care of. The town took care of the last one, but that was a major, that was when it snowed for, um, what we have, a foot, 18 inches of snow, and that same night we had the hurricane, uh, 75 mile of winds, and that's what brought the branches down. Yeah. I've been there 45 years. I can only remember that happening twice mm -hmm. in 45 years. It's not a freak thing, you know, it's the small branches come down, it's a pine tree. Yeah. They all fall. And your power supply is not near the tree, I assume? My, my, my lines are right under the tree. Yeah, okay. okay. They did fall on it once. They didn't break, the, you know, they just, we had to have them removed because I, would do, I would, didn't want to remove them because they were on the electrical wires, but they didn't break. Okay. That's the only two times in 45 years that I know that the power has been affected. It didn't affect the power to my house or anything. It's because it took his line down. Okay. And that's the only reason, you know. Okay. So you're asking the board not to allow the tree to be removed? Uh, the town correct? of Tewksbury, when they cleaned up and stuff, I asked them when they come, uh, do you think we should take the tree down? And they always say, it's a good tree, it's um, healthy, it's tall, it's straight, it doesn't move. You know, it loses a branch here and there, but then they, they recommended me not to take it down. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sitting at my window yesterday when we have all this big wind yesterday. I'm looking across 
in back of the house behind me, and I'm seeing their pine trees, and they're waving like about a 20 degree angle back and forth. This tree doesn't even <coughs> move. It's like this big around, and it's sturdy, it's straight. The only problem is once in a while, because of that snowstorm and the heavy snow, it brought down a branch. Mm -hmm. It brings down branches here and there. They're usually minor ones. This was a big branch because of the snow and the hurricane winds. Okay. That was my, that's my only thing. Okay. And thank you. Thank you. For listening. All right. Thank you. And thank you both for your patience tonight. I'm sure you thought you were going to be heard about 730, <clears throat> right? And here we are. So, um, okay. Let me open up to my colleagues. Um, we have the uh, responsibility of um, determining the fate of the tree. So, um, Mr. Uh, Crapman, do you have any comments, suggestions? Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, Mr. Hardiman, you've been out there, you've reviewed the tree. Um, is this something that uh, you think would typical trimming or could be maintained? Or we're hearing that limbs are falling all the time and then we're hearing that the tree is healthy. What is your determination on this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Mr. Craven. Uh, so I have been out there. The forestry division has been out there. We've assessed the tree. Uh, it is a healthy tree. We have performed pruning, pruning to remove some of the, the dead and dangerous limbs. Uh, but at this point, you know, no different than any other pine tree. Uh, you know, it is a healthy tree. And, um, you know, I don't see the, the eminent hazard uh, associated with that tree. Okay. Uh, one other question, I know they're talking about the limbs, but one of the things I always notice when uh, the trees are out there, is there any sight distance or anything when people are coming out of their driveways, coming out, I know we get trees on the edge of the road and sometimes people pulling on a driveway causes some type of sight distance. Is this any problem out there? Or? No, there are no sight distance issues with this tree. Uh, it's actually right adjacent to a cul-de-sac at the end of the road. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Holland. Mr. Holland, do you have any questions? I have none. Mr. Crapman asked the questions I was going to ask. Okay. Mr. Mackey, anything? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Only question I have uh, through you to Mr. Hardiman is that what is the proximity to, the, I believe it was an oak, because I know we do have or have had concerns in the past about standalone pines. Is that a consideration here? Uh, I would consider this a standalone pine. Uh, the oak tree is maybe 10, 10 feet at the most, trunk to trunk. Uh, and this tree, this pine tree is significantly taller than the oak tree. Uh, but like I said, we've limbed up most of the, uh, you know, the deadwood in that tree and it is a healthy trunk. Okay, thank you. So. Ms. Wellman, anything? <clears throat> sure. Um, this is not the same sort of pine as all the other pines were taken out off Whipple Road? This is a similar pine. Uh, this has a, a slightly larger girth to it uh, mm -hmm. all the way up. Um, and like I said, the, the majority of the lower limbs, or actually all of the lower limbs have been removed, uh, like the resident said, probably to about 75 feet. Mm -hmm. So it takes that wind shear out of it, so there is less wind pressure on that tree. Okay. Um, you know, it does have a slight lean to it, uh, but it is it is a healthy tree, uh, and we you know we did assess it. Did you do like a boring analysis on it? We yeah. did not. I'm, what? I'm I'm really not in favor of the the damage associated with those uh, to the trunk. Uh, no, it, so we have two staff members uh, yeah. at the DPW that have, are certified uh, in hazard tree assessments, uh, and they both looked at it and and didn't deem it a hazard. Okay. Um, and it has a, does it have a shallow root system? These, these pine trees yeah. have shallow root systems. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now that it's come to a hearing, if this falls and falls on either of their houses, the town's liable under the insurance policy because it's come to a hearing and the applicant has requested it to be removed. So if any happens, we're responsible for it. Uh, no, no different than any other tree that was you know, looked at and not deemed a hazard. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
I'm sympathetic. I have to say, I'm sympathetic to the homeowner um, and the the damage that you that the disruption that this particular tree, which we consider a nuisance in other parts of town, um, seems to be providing to your property. And I'm sympathetic to your neighbors who don't want to take down a tree because I don't like taking down trees either. So I'm conflicted. Um, but I um, I appreciate your assessment, Mr. Hardiman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, which brings me to a question. I don't know if Mr. Hardiman can answer it, nor the resident, but um, are there any alternatives to the power supply route to the home? I do not have the expertise to answer that. You want to offer a comment? Come to that microphone then. Okay. Thank you. If there's an alternative, oh, yeah. you're looking for an alternative. If there's one alternative. Yeah. And that alternative is for me at my cost to put everything underneath and run it into my house, which is significant expense. Significant cost. Okay. And if I may, yeah. again, it's only dropping cable up until the uh, to the electricity. But at one point, several years ago, I actually ended up having to cause call the Tuscaloosa Police Department because I got a call when I was at work at night. My wife, there was a branch hanging on the electrical line. And the gentleman of 49 Compass Lane was trying to pull it off. Worst case scenario for me, I have to pay to restore my service. Worst case for him, he's deceased. At some point, this is, this is costing me a lot of money. Okay. And like I say, I'm not unsympathetic to their cause, but it's coming out of my pocket. Understood. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there's no further, oh, Mr. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one more question. Do we have uh, the opportunity or a mechanism by which to plant a replacement tree? It's obviously not going to uh, immediately take the place of a 27 inch, uh, sounds like 100 foot plus. Yeah. Yeah, 75, 100 foot pine. Um, but is there an opportunity there? That, that is a great question. Uh, typically, when we issue a tree removal permit to a resident, uh, it does have a condition that they have to provide a replacement tree uh, at the either the location of the tree that was removed, if it is appropriate, if it's not under power lines and things like that, uh, or at a location determined by the tree board. Has that been discussed through this process? Yes, So that, that and that would be a condition of the, the tree removal permit. And has the location of that tree been determined? It has not, no. Okay. Would it, would it, is there a likelihood that it would go in a similar location? Because I assume we're not replacing a pine, uh, so it would probably be another, a hardwood tree. Right. Is it likely going in that vicinity? <laughs> it could possibly go in the vicinity. So under Chapter 87, uh, the law covers public shade trees that are planted within up to 20 feet of the edge of the right-of-way. Now this tree is within probably 18 inches of the uh, edge of the roadway. Uh, the, the unique situation we have on Compass Lane is that the right-of-way consists of two parallel sides even as it goes through the cul-de-sac. So the, the cul-de-sac exists, and, and per the plans I've researched, the cul-de-sac was supposed to be a temporary turnaround, and Compass Lane was supposed to extend beyond where it and terminates now. Uh, so to, con to f for the uh, resident who's requesting the tree to be removed, to install a uh, plant a tree within 20 feet of the right of way, you get into a situation where the majority of that 20 foot strip is comprised of asphalt within the cul-de-sac. Interesting. It's, okay. Yeah, I was a, trying to see if there was a, a way to um, kind of right. so, uh, meet and in then, the middle somewhere. Right. And then looking at the resident at 49 Compass Lane, the, the edge of the right-of-way is within a couple feet of the edge of the roadway, so there really is no room in this situation to plant a replacement tree, uh, just the way the, the configuration is. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, it, it is though something, you know, we can look at and, you know, I'd be happy to go out there with the residents and see what we can, you know, uh, 
discuss and, and figure out. I think that would be mm -hmm. beneficial, um, it just given the, the concerns from the residents at 49. Um, again, obviously, the resident at uh, 59, it's, it's a concern if it's causing damage, if there are hazards, right. additional costs. We want to address that, but uh, I, I don't want to lose a tree, uh, especially if it's a, a shade tree or something that is uh, enjoyed by those residents. So right. if we can find a location that uh, may be amenable to the residents at 49, I think that would be beneficial. Thank you. Okay. Okay. We need to uh, take action of some sort. So let me uh, ask if there's any motions on the part of my colleagues. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to grant the applicant's request to uh, have a permit to remove the tree. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion offered by Ms. Wellman, a second by Mr. Mackey. Uh, Mr. Kratman, how do you vote? Nick. I'm sorry, was that nay? No. No, no. thank you. Know. Thank you. It's hard to hear. Mr. Holland? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Yay. Ms. Wellman? Aye. And I'll vote in the affirmative as well. I think the safety factor is significant. So we need to be cognizant of that. And I, I also would encourage um, the tree warden to work to find a suitable place for a planting. Well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to try to pick up some speed here. Trahan Elementary Reuse. Mr. Montori, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so this past uh, month, we um, uh, had uh, advertised for proposals to reuse, for the reuse of the Trahan uh, Elementary School, the former Trahan Elementary School. And uh, we did not receive any proposals by the deadline that we had. Um, not sure why, uh, but uh, I wanted to talk with the board uh, to get a sense of how you want to move forward. Uh, I would recommend that we um, advertise again to see if there's any interest. Um, it was, it's interesting, today I uh, received an email from uh, Boston Hockey Academy who uh, was interested in the school and said, um, they've never been through this process before so they really don't know how it works, but they just completed their design and they are still interested. So I think it might be worth uh, going back out. Um, the housing authority uh, may be interested in either the Trahan or the North Street School for some type of senior housing. Uh, so uh, I think it's worth uh, continuing the process. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure the board was supportive of that. Are there questions on the part of my colleagues? Yep. You have questions, Ms. Wellman? Of course, I, I know. I'll try not to make I it know. off. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Mr. Martori. Um, I, I, I appreciate your um, qualification of Boston Hockey that they um, this is they're new to this sort of you know municipal procurement process, which will drive anybody nuts. So um, so I appreciate that. I just want to reiterate that. Um, and I, I like that the housing authority actually is interested in it potentially. That's new news to me, and um, and so I'm curious about that. I think there's some good there there um, locally. So yeah, I would support your effort to uh, to go back out and see what they can do. Um, I do think it's a great opportunity to to preserve that as open space for the town, ideally. Um, and um, I'm certainly in favor of the whole area being a park um, for use in in town. I think it's we we need more of that more of that, and, or potentially um, and or field space, athletic field space. I, I think that there's probably a call for that as well. So thank you. Okay, I thought you had a question, but I'm going to ask you if you'll offer a motion. Um, yes, sir. I will offer a motion um, to go back out to. Um, to bid or RFP on the Trahan Elementary Reuse Project. Um, thank you. Second for discussion, um, actually for comment I'll say. Um, I support this, I would also like to see us be a little more aggressive um, on reaching out, making sure that we're 
uh, advertising as best we can and trying to engage with uh, whether it's Housing Authority or Boston Hockey, but trying to really push a little bit more. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we have a motion offered by Ms. Wellman and seconded by Mr. Mackey to uh, re-advertise. Um, and uh, I will ask Mr. Kratman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Holland? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Johnson votes in the affirmative. That's a five to zero vote. Um, thank you. Hopefully we can advance that a little bit. Um, sale of town land. We have um, uh, a listing. You want to speak to that? I, just, I was just going to mention if anybody has any comments on the RFP that went out. I know each of you have a copy. Just let me know. We'll, we're going to put the advertisement in, but uh, we can make changes also. Okay. Okay, so you are... Um, looking for us to support the sale of these properties, is that correct? Yes, both the, uh, the assistant town manager was um, the uh, point person on the sale of the property. He did a great job uh, on uh, the uh, RFPs and the, um, or the bids and the uh, uh, review, uh, and we're recommending the board approve the list. Okay, so for public benefit, I'm going to read the proposed transactions. Um, in October of 2023, Article 17, the town meeting authorized the sale of the following town-owned parcels. Um, the first one is Georgia Road, Map 94, Lot 20. The parcel acreage is 0 .05 of an acre. The bidder is Keiko Stack and um, the bid was $4,600. Newton Avenue, map 47, lot 156. It's a tenth of an acre. Bidder is Wayne Stoll, $5,000 bid. Georgia Road, map 81, lot 220. Again, a tenth of an acre. The bidder is Andrew, Andrea Taylor and Brian Wisely, 6,600. Water Street, map 94, lot 158, seven tenths of an acre. The bidder is Brian and Rosemary McNulty, $12,050. And then uh, in a separate bid opening, Wamaset Road, map 98, lot 48, uh, the parcel acreage is 11 tenths of an acre. The bidder is Kerry Howe and Amanda Grenier and they bid $7,300. Um, so 20, 30, about rough numbers, $35,000 to the town's benefit uh, through the sale of these uh, small parcels. Um, let me ask if there's a motion to uh, authorize the sale as described. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Well. Second. We have a second by Mr. Holland. Mr. Crabman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Holland? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Johnson votes aye, so that would be five to zero in favor of those transactions. The next item we have is, uh, I believe, a request to sign the annual and special town meeting warrant. Um, any comments necessary, Mr. Montori, on that? No? Okay, so the Town meeting will take place on uh, Monday, May 6, 2024. Um, town election, as previously known, is Saturday, April 6, 2024, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and Article 1 will um, be the actual election of various um, positions here in town, elective offices here in town. Polling precincts one and five are at the senior center, two and six are at the recreation center, three and seven at the town hall, four and eight at our public library. All those in favor of authorizing the execution of the warrant, please signify, oh, I can't take do it that way. I need a vote. Motion mm -hmm. um, and a vote. So moved. <laughs> so, second. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mackey, and second by Ms. Wellman. Uh, Mr. Crabman, how do you vote, sir? Aye. Mr. Holland? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. And I'll vote in the affirmative as well. So before we leave, three of us will execute that, and we'll hold it for um, the colleagues who aren't present in the room. Um, and um, we also need to do the same on the annual election town warrant. So um, 
Can I have a separate vote on that? So moved. I'll second. Thank you. So the motion's by Mr. Mackey, seconded by Ms. Wellman. Mr. Craven, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Holland? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. And I'll vote in the affirmative as well. So um, both warrants, special and annual, and the election warrant have all been approved. That brings us to you, Mr. Montori, of Town Council invoice. I do. Um, we have an invoice for Town Council uh, for January 16th through January 31st, 2024, in the amount of $2,762.50, and I would recommend approval. So moved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wellman, for the motion. Mr. Crabman, for the second. Mr. Crabman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Holland? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. I'll vote in the affirmative. That's five to zero, uh, approving that town council invoice. That brings us to minutes. Mr. Holland, do you want to offer any motions? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of December 19th, 2023. Second. Okay, we have a motion made by Mr. Holland, seconded by Ms. Wellman. Mr. Crabman, how do you vote on that? Aye. And Mr. Holland? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. And I'll vote in the affirmative. That's approved five to zero. Do you have another motion? Yes, I have another motion to approve the minutes of January 25th, 2024. Second. We have a second by Mr. Uh, Crabman uh, to the motion <coughs> offered by Mr. Holland. Mr. Crabman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Holland? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. I'll vote in the affirmative as well. So that's five to zero, approving that set of minutes. Um, okay, that brings us to board member reports. Mr. Crabman, do you have any reports to offer? I have nothing to report this week, but thank you. Mr. Holland? I have none. Mr. Mackey? No report. Ms. Wellman? Let's make that four. Okay. No report. And uh, the night is getting late. I'm going to refrain from any comments this evening, so um, I won't offer any either. Um, that brings us to the conclusion. Do you have any other comments? Or, um, that brings us to the conclusion of our meeting. I want to note for um, the record, um, this meeting had to be adjusted due to the election that took place last week. So um, we are having a uh, previously and regular scheduled meeting next Tuesday, March 19. Um, so uh, a little bit different in the sequence of the month, um, but we will meet here starting at 7 p.m. next Tuesday the 19th. Um, with that having been said, let me ask if there's a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Mackey, seconded by Mr. Crabman. Mr. Crabman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Holland? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. And I'll vote in the affirmative. So we are now adjourned at um, 845.